Hjertelig velkommen til en ny episode av podcastserien Norges Råste. Nu sitter jeg faktisk i et uh, corner office i uh, New York, på, uh, i det som da er uh, faktisk et av verdens beste uh, markedsbyråer. Vi sitter hos uh, TWA, Shiet Day, og uh, mannen som jeg sitter sammen med nå, det er uh, Rob Schwartz, som er uh, CEO her i New York kontoret. Så nu kommer jeg til at switche om på engelsk, fordi han snakker ikke norsk. So, uh, uh, so uh, Rob, I just introduced you now. So thank you so much for having us. I could not have said it better myself. <laughs> thank you. So um, one of the things that you might not know is that uh, Lars and I, we um, we are only staying here for. Uh, till tomorrow because the only reason we got here was to meet you. Wow! So I'm uh, so I'm really glad that you said yes, uh, and I'm and I'm really excited. So thank you again. Yeah, listen, I'm I'm honored, and uh, thank you guys for uh, you know making the trip from Norway. Absolutely. So um, so so Rob, I've I've seen um, uh, some of the stuff that uh, that you guys are doing here. Also, I saw the presentation that you had at Yale University. I also looked at your LinkedIn profile. So if my research is correct, you've been working uh, for TWA or this year in, in uh, 20 somewhat years? Just, yeah, to, uh, I celebrated my 20th anniversary this year. Okay, cool. So um, for the people that don't know you, would you uh, kindly give us a brief introduction of, of who you are and, and your career journey? Sure. Uh I've uh, been the CEO here of uh, TBWA Shiate in New York since 2015. Uh, I'll go backwards. We'll be disruptive sure. that way. And uh, prior to that, I was uh, I was a creative director, a global creative director. And uh, so I made a transition from uh, you know being a global creative director to a CEO of uh, you know of, of, of an office. Uh, and I've I've, I've had uh, global jobs. I was uh, um, you know I worked on uh, McDonald's globally. Uh, I worked on Nissan globally, uh, and then prior to that, I was the chief creative officer, uh, the CCO of our Los Angeles office for a number of years. Um, and uh, prior to that, I uh, was a creative director uh, within the LA office, and I worked uh, uh, before that uh, at uh, Team One, which is a boutique uh, of Saatchi and Saatchi, and I started my career uh, here in New York, believe it or not, many moons ago uh, as a as a proofreader and copy typist. I wasn't even a, a copywriter. That was back even, <laughs> even before computers and we had to type stuff. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's been my uh, trajectory. And now, uh, since you uh, took over, uh, was that, uh, is that four years ago? Yes. Four years ago. Um, it, it's, it says on your LinkedIn profile that you've seen uh, uh, massive growth the, the, last, uh, the last years. Yeah, when I started, we were uh, 170 people. Uh, we're almost uh, up to 260 uh, now. Uh, and uh, as uh, our global uh, CEO uh, of the collective, the TBWA collective, Roy, uh, Troy Ruhanen, says uh, we've experienced a 300% growth uh, just over the last few years. So, yeah, it's been, uh, uh, it's been really um, exhilarating. Great. So... Um, one um, one of the reasons why I wanted to to come over here and 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 talk to you and and have this podcast with you is because um, uh, yourself and and the company that you're representing uh, is working with some of the most uh, uh, eminent clients uh, in in the world among uh, uh, Nissan, uh, McDonald's, uh, Apple, of course, which um, I'm sure m- so many are uh, inspired by. Um, there, there's a magazine in front of me uh, which uh, names you the uh, Global Agency of the Year. Uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about that and, and uh, what, what are ag- exactly the criteria of, of becoming the, the Global Agency of the Year? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, yeah, it was uh, you know, quite an honor to be Ad Week's uh, Global Agency of the Year. I think first and foremost, they, they look at the the output, the creative, uh, you know, the, the work we produce on behalf of these clients. And I think if you look uh, across uh, what we call the collective, um, or even disruptive in how we uh, refer to ourselves, we don't see ourselves as a network, but across our collective, 
Uh, we've done some very iconic work, uh, whether it's uh, for Apple. Um, again, as part of our collective, Lucky Generals in London did some brilliant work for Amazon. Uh, we've done some great work for McDonald's. Uh, we've done some uh, powerful things for Michelin, for, for, for Nissan, uh, for the Thomson Reuters Foundation, um, you know, several different clients. So I think that the, the first criteria is the creative. The second criteria uh, is uh, really the people uh, and, and uh, how diverse they are uh, uh, in terms of diverse talent, diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse uh, ethnicities. And I think what's, uh, what's, what's always been um, powerful about TBWA uh, is that we, we just look for interesting people, that we don't necessarily look for the same uh, cookie cutter uh, folks that, that uh, you know, uh, there seems to be too much of uh, in our business. So between the creative, uh, you know, the, the, the people, um, and then any other forms of innovation, and we, um, uh, we've done some interesting things. Uh, we have something called Backslash, uh, which is our um, editorial arm. Uh, it, 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 every day in our, uh, uh, in our inboxes, we find uh, an interesting film about something that's going on in the world. Uh, we're doing a lot of interesting other um, ways of working uh, that just, uh, you know, are really separating us from uh, this kind of cliched uh, dinosaur, um, you know, global network. I, th I think we kind of refuse to believe that uh, um, a creative company, uh, you know, can't uh, thrive in this uh, truly, uh, um, you know, chaotic atmosphere. Yeah. So. I, I th this is uh, this goes for every market, every segment, every country, but the the thing that the every brand wants, every company wants is uh, is some form of attention, and uh, and I think the the attention game in in the U.S. is a bit different from Norway. Um, I would say that our perception in Norway is that America is very uh, very loud, very glossy, very flashy. Um, when you have, uh, and then uh, my, my question is in regards to your, and we, we're going to deep dive into that later, but you said in your presentation at, at Yale University that uh, obviously you are, you name yourself the disruption company, but you also said that you want to kill boring. Now, um, how, uh, how do you actually do that as a marketeer, as a, uh, as a creative? Well, man, there's just so much to unpack in that question. <laughs> uh, I think on the attention thing, let's just start there for a moment. You know, I read something wonderful from um, uh, John Haggerty uh, from BBH, uh, and he said that, you know, uh, the best creative, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, he said it better than I'll say it, but he said the best creative is actually aimed at the most precious piece of real estate in the world the most precious piece of real estate. And that piece of real estate is someone's mind. Mm. You know, to, to have a brand find its place into someone's mind and therefore their daily life, that's not easy. So I think this attention game is a bit of a real estate challenge. And how can we find our place in someone's mind and ultimately into someone's life? And for us, uh, if you want to use America as an example, uh, I don't think anybody is really uncomfortable um, telling our story and trying to uh, get an unfair advantage of, uh, of attention uh, and an unfair advantage of uh, someone's headspace, be it a consumer on behalf of the brands that we work with or be it a CMO. Mm. So your other questions were around kill boring. Yeah. Do you like that? Yeah, I think that was a good one. Uh, Kill Boring uh, was born a few years ago um, uh, as, uh, as, as, as Troy came in to his role uh, as the global uh, <coughs> CEO. Um, he had a very interesting purview because he, uh, he'd worked at BBDO, he'd worked at Leo Burnett. So he'd worked at these two networks that competed against uh, TBWA. Yeah. Uh, and then he worked uh, at Omnicom. So he saw across uh, the Omnicom portfolio. 
So for that experience, um, excuse me, in that experience, number one, he saw disruption as this very unique offering uh, that other companies didn't have. But he also saw within the portfolio uh, and throughout the uh, history of TVWA uh, and Shia Day that there were these uh, ideas that were electrifying and exciting, you know, whether it was for uh, a Sony PlayStation or, you know, for Apple uh, or for Nissan, um, that the collective itself uh, was somehow uh, in the business of, uh, you know, defeating dullness and boring stuff on a daily basis. And he wanted us to tap into that. Uh, and I think that was something that uh, a few years ago uh, really inspired the collective to go, yeah, let's try to create some more, uh, you know, exciting uh, work. So do you have an example of where you went into a kind of like an average idea and then you actually where where you can talk about being practical about killing boring? Uh, kill boring, I don't think is a, um, at least currently, uh, a methodology, unlike disruption. Disruption is a methodology. Kill boring, I think, is a, um, uh, it's, it's, it's more of a battle cry. So before we uh, head into the, some of the principles mm. that you have in regards to storytelling, which I found uh, really fascinating, and and our Slack channel went crazy when I shared your video with the um, with the people back home. Uh, so I have a few questions there, but before we uh, head into that, uh, you, you do have a disruption uh, methodology, um, as you as you claim you are the disruption company. Um, I've I've seen the the grid uh, video, mm -hmm. uh, but for the people who haven't mm. seen it. What, what, what is disruption for you? Well, disruption uh, was a theory of our chairman, Jean-Marie Drew. So, uh, uh, and, and Jean-Marie, um, you know, uh, came up with this uh, notion. Uh, he loved advertising. He loved great advertising. This goes back, to, uh, you know, to the, to the late 80s, early 90s. Um, you know, he loved great advertising. And he was looking for a way to get to that. How could we do that consistently? How could it just not be, oh, you know, the you know, brilliant you know, creative you know, comes up with something and suddenly it's amazing. Like, was there a way to, um, I don't want to say systematize creativity because that makes it sound cold and cookie cutter. It's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. But was there a way at least to have a, an approach? And that became disruption. Uh, and disruption is three parts. Uh, and you can start anywhere, but I'll start in a very linear fashion. Uh, for any category, there are conventions. There are things that brands do over and over again, be it in their products, uh, in their marketing, uh, in their advertising. And you look for those conventions. And once you understand those conventions, you can start to see white space. You can start to see uh, the, the cracks mm. uh, in the conventions. And, and I think one of the best uh, examples of this comes from art. You know, Picasso was a brilliant portrait painter, uh, and that was the convention of the time. Uh, but when you look at Picasso and when he uh, invented cubism, this was a uh, reaction, a disruption uh, of conventional painting. And that's really what we're trying to do uh, in the world of uh, communications. So you understand your conventions, you start to see some cracks. You work with a brand and you understand their vision. There's, there's a place, uh, what we call a share of the future that a brand is trying to achieve. And when you have this vision articulated, you know, what the brand's trying to achieve, the conventions that maybe they're stuck in or, or holding them back, you start to say, what can we do to break those conventions to achieve that vision? And as I explain it to you, I think a lot of your listeners may go, wow, that's kind of my process already. You know, a lot of creative people felt like, you know, when I explain it that way, uh, they go, wow, it's sort of intuitive. And that's the power of it. Yes, it's very intuitive. But the fact that you go to uh, clients and say, this is how we're going to do it, that in and of itself uh, is a breakthrough. Mm. So... When you you are working with some of the the biggest brands in the world, uh, 
what uh, can you uh, without uh, going into details so a single client can you uh, give us a glimpse of what the creative uh, is or what you're doing uh, sure I mean across uh, across the collective I mean I think you know uh, Apple I think is, is quite uh, um, you know conspicuous in the world uh, and uh, you know uh, what, what we're trying to do is what we've always done for Apple which is try to demonstrate the products in a way that's very modern and that's uh, you know irresistible uh, so I think we've been quite consistent there and even though you know, we, we, we wrote the tagline, Think Different, uh, you know, back in the, the late 90s, I think 1997. Were that you? Uh, no, it wasn't me. No, okay. uh, a guy named Craig Tanamoto, yeah. actually an art director, came up with it. Um, that line itself, uh, I think, guides the work, but not in, uh, in, in an obvious way. That's, uh, yeah. they, they, they don't use that tagline. But, but Thinking Different is, is really the, 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 you know, the, the power of Apple um, uh, from, you know, from a communication standpoint, uh, especially. Uh, for Nissan, uh, we uh, have an interesting disruption for them, which is uh, the fact that in a world that is obsessed with gadgets and the role of the automobile has taken a back seat to the phone, to the tablet, uh, what we realized and what was disruptive is that the car is actually the greatest piece of technology uh, you know, maybe in the history of mankind, it's technology that actually moves. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very powerful uh, positioning that we've unearthed for Nissan. So we're starting to, uh, you know, unleash that onto the world. And I think what's powerful about that is if you, you know, if the convention is to look at a car company like a car, we're going to see this sea of car advertising that we've lived with, you know, for the past 35 you know, to 50 years. But if you look at a car as a piece of technology, uh, it starts to change the way uh, you'll bring that to life. And I think we, we started to see the seeds of this change. We did a, a really nice film uh, that worked across uh, all platforms uh, for the, this car, the Nissan Kicks. Uh, and it was this guy who uh, is walking on the street and he, uh, he, you know, he, he's, he uh, wants to, to kind of put his technology into his life, wants to put his technology on. And the car, you know, literally builds around him mm -hmm. like a piece of technology. And I think something like that is the beginnings of a disruptive idea that uh, cars can be technology. Uh, we're doing all kinds of interesting stuff for McDonald's across the globe. McDonald's is interesting because uh, while there are some uh, universal brand, um, you know, positioning, there's a universal brand positioning uh, about feel-good moments for the brand uh, and making those feel-good moments easy for everyone, uh, it's a very local business. So mm -hmm. in places like France, uh, in places like um, you know Japan, we're doing some very interesting stuff. And, and here in New York, uh, we worked with our team in Switzerland. Uh, we really did some uh, very cool posters uh, for the Big Mac 50. Mm. And again, a disruptive idea. Uh, I think uh, you know, oftentimes you get a brief for a... Um, uh, you know, kind of a, a celebration of a year. Oh, it's the 40th, it's the 50th. And I think what we did was show the, the, the customer journey, you know, you know, between, you know, the VHS tape and, uh, you know, where we are today with, uh, uh, you know, watching things on our tablets. Like, could we tell these journeys within mm -hmm. each uh, uh, poster? Mm -hmm. So just a couple of things we're working on. So, so uh, uh, working at an uh, agency like yours, uh, there's... Uh, there's this. Uh, it, it's almost a law that you that you need to be creative, that you need to think different, that you need to disrupt, or uh, because it, it is in the DNA, it's in in your genes. But working with uh, uh, not only big brands, mm -hmm. but or big companies, but also small businesses, um, you will meet people that are not that forward thinking or forward leaning, or, or don't have that mindset as the agency has or as the creative does. Um, w uh, what do you experience as the challenges from um, other business leaders where they don't do things right marketing-wise? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, uh, you know, you say, you know, 
you know, everyone's creative uh, in, a, in, a, in a creative company. I think the best creative companies, that's true. Uh, crea creativity does not have to be confined to the creative department. Um, and I think that's always been uh, the, you know, the case uh, you know, for this company. Um, part of it is uh, how you hire. And that's, uh, you know, it goes back to when Jay Shiat, the founder of this agency, worked with Steve Jobs in 1982. Uh, and uh, at some moment, uh, they both understood that uh, uh, there were companies that had pirate cultures and there were companies that had naval cultures, mm. pirates in the Navy. I think it's a very good uh, metaphor for this. Uh, and, uh, you know, a Navy culture uh, is good, uh, you know, because it's very good for systems and it's very good for um, repeatable systems and people who uh, don't necessarily have the energy to be creative because it takes an inordinate amount of energy yeah. uh, to be a creative person in whatever skill you're in uh, versus being, uh, uh, you know, more, I, I hate to sound so negative, a cog in the wheel. I don't mean it dismissively, but it takes a lot more energy. It takes a lot more energy to think a little bit further that your email should have something uh, a little bit more memorable to it, that your yeah. business card should be somewhat uh, more interesting, yeah. uh, that your conversation should remind someone that, wow, these, these people are really kind of interesting. So I just think that that um, division between a pirate culture and a naval culture uh, has uh, been the guiding principle for us uh, as, as, uh, as a way to operate. Mm. Now, to your question about uh, what I heard in it is maybe how you get clients to be more adventurous. No, so, 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 so my, my point is that, uh, so let's, uh, so, so you would be a pirate here. So you, you guys are pirates. Mm. But the clients that you're working with, or even let's not talk about your clients, just the, the average business out there, mm. the average uh, corporation, mm. they don't think like you do. Mm. They don't see the world like you do. So because they, uh, they have so many different uh, bias viewpoints in yeah. their own organization. So what do you see as the biggest challenge of trying to speak with people who don't see the world the same as you? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a key question. Uh, what we've found uh, is that there is a little pirate in all of us. There is something in almost every brand um, in, in particular that has somehow broken through. If you are, are a uh, brand in the world today with any relevance, you will have broken through in some way. At one point, IBM was a pirate organization. There was not, uh, you know, uh, um, business machines for the masses, you know, and IBM had to break through. You think of the most conservative companies today. At one point, they were not conservative. They had to mm. break through. So sometimes with a client, you have to remind them that, within their DNA was disruption. Within their DNA was uh, a refusal to accept things as they were. And you can throw it out in any category. Uh, you know, even the US Post Office. At one point, Ben Franklin had to come up with this idea that we were gonna connect these colonies uh, through the Postal Service. This was a disruptive idea. Mm -hmm. Although now you look at the Post Office as something that frankly, needs to be more disruptive. They need to reinvent again, but for a lot of years, they, they didn't have to. Yeah. By the way, you like all these sirens? Uh, yeah, I, th I, think it, I think that's <laughs> fine. And, 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 that, and actually, that, that brings me to, uh, to, to another point, because back in um, the, the thing that we see back in Norway, and I'm sure it is here in the US as well, is that uh, marketing needs to be more authentic. It needs to be more genuine. Mm -hmm. It needs to tell more... Um, real stories mm -hmm. and um, um, in um, in Norwegian I uh, I say that we need to show what's raw and what's real mm -hmm. 
and now when you're talking about do you think it's fun with sirens and, and, and stuff we in in the content that we we produce as a company we don't care about what's retouched or we, we don't want to do that we want to show the uh, warts and all if, if you know what I mean do Norwegians even have warts I, <laughs> I, I guess some do <laughs> uh, but um, that's not the um, that's not the feeling I have in in the US where I my my perception mm. and, and some of my colleagues and also my friends our perception is that in in America in every marketing in every marketing message um, it's somewhat retouched how how do you how do you do you do you agree to that? I think the only thing that, uh, that that's retouched is our president. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it's a provocative assertion. I think that uh, sometimes when I hear authentic, that word in particular, uh, like every fiber in my being just sort of like raises up. Hmm. Because I think that this word has been used and abused, uh, this authentic marketing. Um, I think what the best brands are trying to do is they're trying to be relevant. Mm. And I think that they're, uh, uh, since Dove um, has kind of removed the varnish off of uh, models, when they move to this you know, very beautiful and disruptive idea about you know, Dove's real beauty, uh, a lot of brands took notice. You know, this was a seminal moment, uh, you know, in, in, in the world of communication. And people kind of looked at Dove and said, ooh, something's happening here. That to be more relevant, maybe we shouldn't, as you say, over-retouch these models. Because there was, there was a movement in marketing to use another wonderful uh, abused ridiculous word now to show people what they should aspire mm -hmm, mm -hmm. aspirational marketing <laughs> here's the ideal mm -hmm. so there was a whole school of marketing that was well this is the aspiration of what we want uh, you know people to look like so you have these two opposites i would say at the moment now and i would call them two conventions i think authentic is its own convention now mm -hmm. and i think aspiration is its own uh, a convention now and I think we have to kind of break through those to, to, to the relevance yeah but um, in terms of that then mm. uh, do you uh, would you like to sh sh uh, b because you have this disruption model mm. there must be some clients that you don't want to work with is that correct like th there must be some clients that just don't get it yeah, listen there, you know, there there are uh th there are a few clients that are not enlightened and uh, <laughs> I think it goes back to I'm kidding, but uh no no, not everybody wants to be disruptive. That 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 that's for sure. However, um almost every client wants positive change. And I think in a mature market, um it's harder and harder to meet the growth demands of Wall Street. And in order to create growth, uh, you have to create a new future for brands. And uh, I think what we're finding is that a lot of traditional brands know that if they keep doing what they're doing, there'll be a certain flatlining and there'll be a certain erosion of growth at, at a certain point because there's so many uh, new players and you know uh, it's almost like the long tail of players the the smaller players are chipping away at the big players there's no really small player that is suddenly emerging uh, to be the big player again but the constant um, uh, it's almost like uh, swatting flies. The constant, you know, fly swatting mm. uh, that a brand has to do. It, it to me, it's emblematic or um, it's uh, it's a sign that you have to move. You have to move from the flies. You have to move to a different place. And I think any brand that wants growth, that wants to unlock their potential, uh, to create 
new futures uh, and a broader future for themselves, they have to disrupt. They don't really have a choice. Now, whether they come to us or not, that's their, that's their uh, prerogative. But yeah. we, you know, we have a track record and we have a way of getting brands to move. Yeah. So um, that brings me over to um, the next uh, subject, which is your speech at uh, Yale University. Mm. Um, I'm, excuse me for not remembering the, the exact uh, headline, but it was... Oh, I'll help you. Yeah. <laughs> it was seven principles for uh, storytelling in marketing. Very good. You got the numbers. Very good. Was, I got uh, the numbers, but that's <laughs> not, good. not that's the headline. Okay. Uh, the seven stories that yeah. rule the world and the world's best brands. Yeah. Okay. But you you did you did have seven principles. Uh, you you would you could say yes. right? Yeah. Um, now, when you go into a, a company or whoever would go into a company and and try to disrupt and and try to communicate the the essential thing what you're trying to do there is to uh, uh, storytell in a different way mm-hmm. to to create some a new messaging and i haven't seen uh, all of the madman episodes but mm. there's a cool thing where uh, don draper says and and i, I try to quote him correctly mm. he says um, you feeling something that's what sells mm. and um and and I think that was such a great uh, quote. Oh yeah. And um, and that uh, and that was also uh, a parallel to what you were talking about, where um, if you are storytelling uh, correctly, you are feeling something, and you are uh, it's easier to remember. You were also talking about chemicals and stuff, but uh, yeah. it was uh, it was the the feeling that that was, that was my perception after watching it. Could you? Give us a, a brief introduction to some of the principles that uh, that you are most uh, uh, found of. Yeah, interesting. I, I like your takeaway. Um, let me first uh, address the, the feeling thing, because this is something I learned uh, from uh, Phil Dusenberry at BBDO. So I, I didn't work at BBDO, but uh, I read something. Uh, Phil Dusenberry was a legendary creative director, one of the best in our business. Uh, and he said something that was uh, really powerful to me, and I learned this very—I read this very early on in my career, which was, uh, and this is him saying, and me paraphrasing. He said, "If I feel something in the boardroom, I'm going to feel it in the living room." And what I loved about that idea was that there was something in the material that we were producing, you know, in our offices, you know, after all the strategy was done, all the numbers, yeah. and all the, you know, inputs that you actually had to move somebody. And that was really powerful. So I, I, I sort of put that in, um, I don't know, it was, it was, it was part of the, um, the ingredient that got me to storytelling. The seven stories uh, came about because a few years ago, uh, before clients were obsessing over data and AI and whatever shiny object we're talking about now, um, the shiny object was storytelling. And I remember looking at a, uh, uh, there was a Google, um, a piece of data, believe it or not, from Google, uh, that showed a spike in the number of searches uh, for brand storytelling, like uh, in 2006. There was just this, almost a hockey stick of searches that uh, you saw uh, that people are searching storytelling. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so, I, like I told you guys, I started out as a writer. I was an English major in college. Um, uh, I loved uh, literature. I loved film. Uh, I loved stories. And suddenly, I felt, oh my God, I can finally put this degree to work. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's something truly academic in storytelling. And I stumbled upon this book. Uh, by a guy named um, Joseph Booker, uh, an Oxford professor, Professor Booker, uh, a 700 page book. So if anything, I will, I will save your listeners from <laughs> having to read all 700 pages. It's a fabulous book. But he wrote a wonderful book. Um, and his theory was that uh, there were seven plots, seven plot lines, that whether it was Shakespeare or whether it was Steven Spielberg or whether it was Sofia Coppola, uh, you name the storyteller, they based the story on one of these seven stories. And as I read this, I thought, wow, this is really powerful. Just an interesting kind of exercise. And 
it struck me quite early on as I'm reading this, I thought, wow, what if you mapped these seven stories to the best brands? Do brands themselves have narratives? Hmm. Um, because what he was saying in the book and what some subsequent research I did after was that storytelling uh, has been with us uh, encoded in our DNA as humans, you know, back to the beginning of time. And when I say to you, let me tell you a story. Just that phrase mm. itself, yeah, something happens to you. I, and uh, I think there was a Stanford study, a, a University of Toronto study, and I believe uh, uh, a Wharton study uh, that said that you know there's a firing of dopamine. There's all kinds of chemical stuff that happens when I say that simple phrase, let me tell you a story. And if I do it correctly, <coughs> Uh, if I have a beginning, if I have a middle, if I have a rising action, if there's a crescendo, uh, that you come along for the ride chemically, you can't help it as a human. So that kind of alchemy of stuff, uh, I thought would be very powerful for our business. And that became this presentation of the seven stories that rule the world and the world's best brands. Hmm. And, um, and one of the, um, I, I call them principles, that's okay. It's okay. Um, one of the principles was um, uh, the the uh, the hero's quest, or well, the hero's quest is really from uh, Joseph Campbell, uh, who uh, you know did that wonderful work uh, on showcasing that uh, archetype. Um, the seven stories uh, from Booker, and and and, I'll, and I have them here yeah. uh, for us right now, are the following: uh, overcoming the monster. And we can talk about examples. Uh, the Quest, um, Voyage and Return, Rags to Riches, Rebirth, those are five, and then kind of two catch-alls of tragedy and comedy. Mm. And when you take those seven, there are certain archetypes within them. Overcoming the monster, uh, this is biblical. This is David and Goliath, Yeah, you know, the monster being Goliath. Um, and this is something that somebody like Richard Branson, you know, throughout his career, chronically overcame monsters. The monster of uh, British air, mm. you know, the monster of, uh, you know, traditional, you know, record companies. You know, if you look at the Virgin Blueprint as a business, not just advertising, but as a business, they were chronically overcoming the monster to do something smarter. Mm. In the States, we have a, a brand called T-Mobile. It's part of uh, Deutsche Telekom. Uh, I think they've been brilliant at overcoming the monster. You know, their monster is kind of, you know, you know big, dull, and dumb telephony. Mm. And uh, they have taken on the cause of the, of the customer. And they're, together, they're going to overcome uh, you know, all the monster that is the complexity, uh, you know, of, of, of telephony. Quest uh, is, 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 you know, like, uh, you, know, you know, like any quest when you think about, uh, um, say, Lord of the Rings, uh, the quest for the rings, or even uh, Excalibur, you know, the, uh, you know, the, you know tr the quest for that sword. Um, and there are a number of, you know, wonderful quests out there. Um, this is really uh, the Nike blueprint you know when you think about just do it this is really about uh you know going back to uh if you've got a body you're an athlete and bettering your best you know this is really a quest uh to be the best you can be um tesla i find again from their from their business standpoint this is a quest to electrify the world you mm. know in every sense of the world you know tesla at its best um and uh I, I should go back for one second you know overcoming the monster you know maybe one of the best overcoming the monster uh, pieces of advertising ever was Apple's 1984. Yeah, you know, setting up, uh, uh, you know, then you know, in, in air quotes, IBM, the man, uh, uh, and and defeating that, you know, uh, overcoming uh, that, uh, you know, that that um, you know, dull, crazy computer world with a personal computer where I could, you know, uh, you know, me as a, as a lone person uh, mm. could be the most creative I can be. That was a quest for the brand. Uh, and that, that film does it well. But w w would you mm. say that uh, Overcoming the Monster is probably one of the easiest storytelling kind of like techniques? The 
David against Goliath, the underdog, the... Uh, I don't know if I would use the word easy. I think it's uh, intuitive because I think uh, as a human, uh, we we sort of are naturally born Davids, you know, no yeah. matter who we are. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, uh, there's always, uh, there's always a monster to overcome. Wh- which of the, uh, uh, which of the seven are, are your favorite? Uh, I like overcoming the monster cause I like the clarity of it. Yeah. You know, I like, uh, uh, finding an enemy, yeah. uh, for brands. I think that, 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 that's quite good. Um, as a business, uh, I like rebirth, you know, as a disruption company, we're trying to. Uh, you know, if you think about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, you know, when the, when the, when the prince kisses Snow White, uh, she's reborn, mm. uh, you know, again. Um, uh, and one of the brands that does it well uh, is uh, is Red Bull. Mm. You know, when you when you when you drink the Red Bull and you uh, are transformed and you you know have these you know wings uh, in quotes. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's what we promise as a company. You know, if you come to me, uh, you know, as as, as a brand. Uh, there's probably something in you that we will, uh, you know, you'll be reborn in some way. You know, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll transform you either to where you were or, um, you know, to a new place uh, that's even stronger than where you were. Yeah. So be- before we uh, uh, go into the uh, more around uh, that uh, principle, because you you also had uh, kind of like a rebirth uh, with your with your new profile. Um, but before we dive into that, I, I have a few questions here okay, from, from okay. Norway. Um, we have, uh, there's actually a, um, a girl from, from Portland who is mm. uh, working for us. Um, she, uh, um, she has a couple of questions. Uh, her name is Jordan again. Um, one of our questions is, um, what are some exercises TWA does to help identify and maintain brand stories? Mm, good question, Jordan. Uh, this seven stories exercise is an excellent one. Uh, and this is one where you can do with, uh, with your clients. Uh, you lay out the seven stories, you explain the, that to, uh, to them, and have the clients write down what story they think that they are trying to tell. And uh, we did this once uh, for Michelin. I thought it was really powerful. And um, I was, I thought for sure this is for uh, one of their, um, uh, you know, one of their passion divisions. Uh, they do some, you know, they do a lot of work with um, uh, racing and, and, and what have you. And I thought for sure that uh, this was really going to be, um, be about a quest. You know, Michelin is always about uh, perfection, you know, these, mm. you know, amazing products. So we go around the room. We did this as, a, as, as an open exercise uh, with some clients in a workshop. And my first surprise was uh, a lot of the story was um, overcoming the monster. And the monster was boredom, mm. interestingly enough, that, that mm. Michelin was there to you know, create excitement for, for, their, for their customers. I was like, wow, okay, fascinating. And then uh, there was another part of the room uh, that was, uh, you know, they went right into Quest. They were really about the uh, obsession uh, and the perfection of, 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 you know, a quality product. But there was one guy, the only client, uh, who thought that the idea was about journey and return. And... You know, everyone sort of, you know, asked him, okay, explain why you think it's journey and return. And he said, because as as a tire brand with the stature of Michelin, they could take a customer into any paddock uh, in a race. They could take them to places, whether it's Porsche or Ford, uh, you know, they can go anywhere Mm. and show parts of the world that no other brand could show you. And that was, you know, how they could serve their customers. And I just remember, you know, you know, the clients that were around the table, everyone just kind of just went, wow, that could be great. And it really helped us, uh, you know, then go and create, uh, you know, some work uh, using that as a guide. So doing the seven stories as an exercise uh, is fantastic. Cool. So uh, she, she has a follow-up question. Uh, All right, Jordan, in, go for it. In, in regards to that. 
So she uh, she says, if a brand identifies with two of the seven story types Rob talks about in his presentation at Yale, is it possible to combine the two, or w- or would it be more powerful only focusing on one? Well, you know, I'm not a blended Scotch fan. You know, uh, <laughs> I, I try to be uh, a, a purist. I try to you know encourage. Uh, our clients to be pure. So I would recommend not doing that. I would try to, I mean, it, you could run parallel paths, but uh, I think it's stronger if people know what the story is. We, we worked with a, um, a Finnish brand. We did, we did a workshop with them uh, called Neste. You may know these, uh, this company, Neste. Fantastic company. Uh, and they were, on, they, we, came, we uh, did the exercise and they were on a quest. Uh, they really liked uh, Quest. Uh, and they were on a quest to make a better world for their children. You know, that anybody who works at Neste, we're going to be on a quest to make a better world for our children. And this is driving the company. You know, it's, it's, it's really powerful. And there might have been a few others in that presentation uh, where you could, you know, potentially combine it where you know, we're overcoming the monster of human fallacy or, or what have you. But doing it as a quest, I think everybody really uh, felt quite strongly that they could deliver on that. Yeah. Do, do, you, uh, do you know any examples of, uh, or would you like to name them, uh, any, any terrible examples of, of uh, storytelling gone wrong? So now you want to get me into trouble? <laughs> uh, it would be funny if we could share one. Storytelling gone wrong. And not off the top of my head, but if well, you threw out some brands, maybe I could tell you if they're... Uh, I mean, one thing that's... Uh, okay, maybe I can help you this way. Um, that wasn't one of Jordan's questions. No? Okay. <laughs> Um, I thought this was kind of interesting. I looked at uh, Interbrand's best global brands. And um, one thing that's powerful that you realize is that uh, of, say, the top uh, 25 or 20, um, a lot of them have stories. Uh, Several of them don't have clear stories. But the ones that have stories are doing well. So, you know, Apple overcoming the monster. Uh, Google is on the quest uh, to organize the world's information. Um, Coca-Cola is on a quest to make the world more open and connected. Um, Amazon, we have kind of, you know, uh, we feel this, this is a rags to riches story. Uh, not only that anybody can shop at Amazon, but the Jeff Bezos story, his origin story is a rags to riches stories, story. And so it's interesting that for the brands that don't really have a clear story, and they may very well have a story, it's just not clear to us mm be it Toyota or Oracle uh, or even or even Honda. Um, you know, their stories just are not clear. Uh, it doesn't mean that, 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 that they're weak brands or not. They're obviously uh, on the interbrand uh, top 20. But they might be able to do things. Uh, they could galvanize their forces even more if their story was clear. Yeah. So I want to do one last question from mm. uh, <laughs> from from Oslo. Um, so we have from, um, um, Hege, Mm -hmm. um, her question is, uh, when is the client, uh, client, uh, demands too big and when is, uh, enough is enough? Well, hey, yeah, I got to think about this. When is the client demand too big? I mean, I, uh, it depends. It depends how uh, you define uh, the demand is, is too much. Um, we found that the more ambitious the brand, the better off we are. We like brands that really want to uh, not just disrupt things, but, but we love this idea of gaining a greater share of the future. So in some ways, um, the only time when it's too much uh, is probably when the fee doesn't meet the ambition. I think there's a sense that, you know, we would love to bring every resource, but I think uh, brands have to also understand, and now more than ever, that uh, they have to pay a bit more. I think brands got very used to uh, cutting agencies to the bone. Yeah. Uh, and one of my New Year's resolutions is to uh, get brands to understand in 2019 that uh, um, we 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 can help them more if uh, uh, you know they they uh, you know pay us accordingly. That makes sense. Um, when is enough enough? Um, 
I think, you know, I'm starting to feel that uh, this data is enough. You know, mm. that I, I love data. I think data can really make things uh, sharper. But at a certain point, we can't use data for everything. You know, data, uh, you know, can look back at something. Uh, it can't always predict the future. Uh, and data is never, that the thing we talked about, the feeling. Yeah. I'm yet to see any data that can truly, um, you know, guarantee feeling. I I'm think so glad that you're bringing that up. I yeah. think there's something, in, there's some interesting eye movement data that I'm quite fond of that they can track eye movement on certain films, which I think we can really optimize uh, for storytelling. But I don't know if, I don't know enough. Uh, there, there might be some uh, data genius who will, you know, uh, you know, storm my LinkedIn page and tell me <laughs> that I was off, but I'm yet to see data that can really capture that this will make me feel something. Mm. I think uh, I think that's such a great point. That's uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, we are hearing back in Norway as well. We we aren't we we are not playing in the league that you are playing, mm -hmm. in, obviously. But um, some of the clients that we um, that we are working with they get so obsessed about um, the the results, the, the numbers, the clicks, the views, mm. that they completely forget about the the feeling that you're creating. Mm. And, and our perception, and, and especially my perception, is that if I can get you to remember something, mm -hmm. that's more important than, than you clicking on something. Yeah, I think it goes back to that uh, that Hegarty thought about uh, owning a piece of someone's mind. Yeah, you know, and maybe we can go a deep, uh, one step deeper. Can we own a, a share in someone's mind and own something in their heart so they take action? Yeah, clicks. It's okay. It's a data point. It's okay. You yeah. know, it's just not. Uh, you know, I I frankly I prefer sales. How about some sales data? You know, can we go back to that data? Yeah, you know, that would be pretty good. Uh, and I like to see, um, uh, you know, sometimes some brand studies on um, on movement, but not just in a quarter. You know, I like to see what is what does a three year move look like? You know, mm. have we you know have we really you know affected something? You know, a bit more. I think we're in such a rush. We think everything's moving so fast, but I'm not sure things move so quickly. I think it. You know, I think the consumers. Uh, the audience, uh, the users, pick, 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 pick what you want to, you know, call our people that we're talking to. I think sometimes they can act very quickly, but I think the overall movement takes a bit of time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, um, I do want to go back to, is it principle number seven, the rebirth? The seven stories, that's number five. Number five. Okay. So, um, uh, do, uh, not to be confused with Mambo number five. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I um, I do want to um, try and wrap this uh, podcast session uh, around with that mm. um, because um, when we when we looked at the stuff that you're doing, we were truly inspired. That's why we invested so much time and effort to to just come here for a essentially a day trip uh, <laughs> uh, i'm not even buying you lunch you make me feel <laughs> no that's fine <laughs> yeah. so um when we saw the it, it was only a three or four minute video mm. about you talking about the 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 reversed backslash and 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 your new branding and 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 how it works and and why you're doing it uh, it was only a Three three minutes, kind of like a um, advertising movie. So it was um, it, it was obviously a narrative there. Um, but I wanted to uh, give you the chance to to talk about your uh, rebirth in terms of that perspective, since you uh, were so fond of it. Uh, well, I don't know specifically what you're referring to, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> you know my. Rebirth, uh, I think maybe more accurately, is, is a, it's a transformation. I um, I never started as a uh, as a business person or somebody who's gonna you know 
work with uh, numbers and spreadsheets. You know, like a lot of people, I got into advertising to not work with numbers and spreadsheets. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm more than okay with it now. Um, you know, it's been remarkable because uh, I loved uh, being a writer. Uh, I, I loved being a creative director. I loved being a global creative director. Um, but I love being a CEO even more. And I think it's because what you don't realize as a creative director is that you are uh, one very important part of the puzzle, but you're not all of the puzzle. And what being a CEO has shown me is that there are so many other pieces to this puzzle uh, of working with brands, of running a business. Um, that I really just wasn't a part of. And now that I'm a part of them, I love the creative, but I love the other pieces uh, as well. And this has just opened up more of the world to me. So I think that's, uh, that's been the, you know, maybe the most, uh, I don't know, powerful benefit mm. of, of making this transformation. And the, the kinds of things that I'm talking about are, um, you know, as a creative, you, uh, even as a, as a chief creative officer, You'll know some of the challenges and problems with the clients, but you're really not um, tasked uh, and brought in super far upstream when things are really either super broken uh, or it's a clean sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do is both uh, what I'm watching strategic planners uh, and account people do uh, is really powerful because they're with the clients so early on in the process just to get to the brief. Uh, and that's really exciting. And that goes back to, they've got to be creative too. Mm. You know, you th if you're going to be an account person in our business, which I, I think we have done a horrible job of celebrating the power of account people because uh, seeing what account people have to do now, uh, I am really blown away. And great account people are super creative and super visionary. Mm. Uh, and the best ones are this way. So I, I have a newfound respect for account people. And on planning, I have a newfound respect for planning because the intellect uh, that you have to bring uh, that has to be balanced with the uh, intuition uh, is really powerful. And I think sometimes we, we force our planners to be too intellectual and not be intuitive enough. And they have to have that balance even before uh, we bring the creatives in. So that's been illuminating. The other illuminating thing are these finance people. Uh, I think it's very powerful. You go back to storytelling. Uh, you know, I work with some fantastic uh, finance people. Uh, our CFO, Brad Applegren, this guy's wonderful. He looks at a spreadsheet uh, and he pulls stories out of the numbers. And I think this is really powerful because a lot of times you think, oh, the, uh, the finance people are just looking to reduce cost. And that is only a small fraction of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, what I love about looking at a spreadsheet and looking at these numbers is that you can tell the story of an agency uh, between the revenue line mm -hmm. and the profit line. Uh, and you can start to put together the health of a company just based on those two data points. And that becomes quite powerful. Uh, and then if you have some profit, if you're, if you're you know, organized well and you're, you're lucky, uh, you get into the entire world of finance, which is really about strategy. It's really about where to put the money uh, to invest in the future. So it's a very long-winded way to say that I guess I've gone from maybe a beautiful 45 degrees of our business to now a full 360 degrees of our business. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I, you know, I couldn't be happier. So to, um, to um, leave a, uh, like a final thought or mm. something, what would you, s um, I think my question has two questions in it, but uh, I'll, I'll try. Um, what would be the, uh, what do you see as a, the, the most interesting marketing trends? Uh, for, for next year and, and, and the coming years? And what would you um, say is the best strategy uh, to, to do marketing uh, creative now? Not only if you have a $10 million budget, but... Oh man, the hardest questions <laughs> for the end. Um, uh, I think there's gonna be two divergent trends. I think there's gonna be the trend of the continued obsession with the shiny object, with 
data and AI and technology and, and blockchain, um, whatever, the, whatever those will yield and whatever the next thing's gonna be, there's gonna be a rush of uh, marketeers and agency people obsessing over shiny objects. And that's fine, we need people to obsess over those shiny objects uh, to show us how to use them. But you're starting to see a divergent path uh, and I'll go back to this magazine cover uh, with Colin Kaepernick there. Mm. This Nike idea from Wyden, which to me was very much uh, in keeping with the best of Nike work, going back to John McEnroe, uh, the tennis player, you know, a controversial uh, player who uh, was just doing it, as it were. Um, this is the other uh, divergence, which is back to an image, a picture, and a set of words. This was a post. This was a social post. Uh, now, there were some choices made. There was an idea about uh, um, defying, being disruptive against the conventional wisdom uh, of standing for something. Don't just um, uh, conform, but stand out. Uh, so there was an idea there. Uh, and there were some uh, uh, creative choices made, black and white, uh, a close-up of the eyes, uh, a serif typeface, uh, and launch it as a social post, then out of home, then film, but launch it first in the most intimate media. Uh, this, I think, was really powerful. So I think that one of the trends that's going to happen is that the good brands are going to go back to uh, very simple questions. What are the pictures and what are the words? What, what, are, what are the basics that we're doing? Um, and I can't wait. I think that's going to be great. And what are the strategies to do that? Having a strategy. That's going to be uh, what's going to be really refreshing. The best brands uh, are going to um, really be relevant based on ways that make the audience feel something. Mm. Um, and uh, I can't wait. I'm ready for 2019. Great. So um, it was, um, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, of course. For, first first of all. Great and, um, and I And I hope you enjoyed the, the, the session. I think we, you uh, dived into some, some really great subjects and you gave us uh, a lot of great answers and some backstories as well. Um, and I'm 100% uh, uh, positive that the people that are listening to this uh, will really feel something when uh, when they're done with this podcast. So, uh, um, so Rob, thank you so much again for um, for letting us uh, come into your office and and play in this podcast. Well, listen, it was my pleasure, and I really appreciate you guys uh, making the trip and uh, know that. Uh you know, Scandinavia in general, Norway in the specific, uh, we, we look to you guys too. I think that uh, uh, this is a very creative part of the world. And uh, this summer I'll be uh, uh, taking a trip uh, all through uh, that area for my 25th wedding anniversary. So I look forward to cool. uh, seeing Oslo uh, up close and personal. <laughs> well, you should have a nice trip then. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you.